So, hey everyone, and welcome to the Good Five panel discussion. My name is Jocelyn, and I'm the APEC Group Lead from uh, MakerDAO. Uh, and it is a great pleasure to participate um, in the panel with our guests from different distinguished DeFi projects in the space. So, uh, I've been in the space for a while now, uh, and I've witnessed how DeFi space actually unfolds. So the DeFi movement actually was born out of a mission, right? To bang the unbang and then uh, at least, you know, uh, uh, or at least, you know, the hard to bang ones. But uh, in the past few years, we have seen, um, you know, a few diverse community ranging from uh, professional speculators and uh, hardcore traders or yield farmers, or they call it DGEN, you know. So having said that, other than the price action, there has been some incredible uh, innovation happening in DeFi, uh, new products, token models, um, governance um, structures that have been pushed out, you know, at a, you know, um, breakneck speed. And uh, this is likely to continue into the next uh, wave of DeFi protocols or DeFi, uh, DeFi space. So, uh, but the thing is, you know, given the quality and originality of many of these projects, we are all wondering where DeFi is going to be head and heading next. So today there's over uh, about 108 billion in total value locked in DeFi protocols on just Ethereum network alone. And, uh, and, but the thing is, let's not forget about, you know, other networks that imploded in terms of TVL uh, for the past half a year, for example, Polygon, um, Binance Smart Chain and Solana uh, and uh, growing, you know, 160 times in a year. I'm sure our audience wants to know where does DeFi go from here and how we can actually bring 100 million users to DeFi by 2025. So, uh, and before we start the panel discussion, I would like to invite our panelists to give a short introduction about themselves and, uh, and the projects that they're working for. So we have Pierce from Reddix, and then we have Amanda from, from SushiSwap, and then we have SJ from Terraform Labs, and we have Mark from uh, Bancor. So um, uh, we'll start with Pierce. Sure, so hi everyone, my name is Piers Ridiard, I'm the CEO of Radix. Uh, Radix is a layer one protocol built specifically to serve DeFi. Uh, we like to say it's DeFi done right. Uh, and we focus on three key areas. The first is uh, 10xing DeFi developer productivity. The second is 100xing security of DeFi. And the last is 1000xing scalability, specifically of what makes DeFi special, which is this concept of composability. So being able to call lots of things all in the same call. Um, we, we were founded about the project started about eight years ago as a research project into scalability. And as it's emerged, what public ledgers are really for and what the power we can unlock with decentralized finance is, we've more and more specialized our technology towards servicing decentralized finance and ultimately re reinventing finance. All right, um, um, Amanda. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Amanda from sushi.com. Uh, sushi is uh, a mainly a decentralized exchange and now growing into just so much more than that. Uh, it's actually our birthday this week. It's actually our birthday today. Uh, Yay! Yeah. Happy hey, birthday. Happy birthday, Sushi. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we've you know come a long way in the past year from uh, just being you know known as a fork of Uniswap. We have moved away. And now uh, sushi.com offers a suite of products, including uh, Kashi, which is our lending and margin trading platform. We have Bento Box, which is our you know, super powerful token vault that allows for dual token usage. We have Miso, our IDO platform. And coming out shortly, we have our highly anticipated uh, launch of Shoyu, which is our NFT artist uh, space. So yeah, it's really fun to be a part of so many different products. And we have SJ from Terraform or, or Terra. Hey, everybody. My name is SJ. I'm the director of special projects at Terraform Labs. As um, many of you may be familiar, Terra is a layer on blockchain as well as a suite of stable coins. So you know, our mission is to create the Terra economy and create new internet monies that can power decentralized finance. Uh, we launched in 2018 and have one of the higher TBLs in the layer one um, market. So we've been I'm uh, excited about what we've built so far. And I think, you know, the future for Terra is really this push for the community to build on, on the Terra chain and using our stable coins. So excited to partner with GoodFi and talk to our community today.
and okay. we have Mark. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, my name is, is Mark Richardson. I'm the head of research at, at Bancor. Uh, Bancor was uh, sort of one of the, uh, the the first projects up to the the DeFi uh, plate. Um, it, it introduced uh, an idea for creating decentralized liquidity that we now call automatic market makers, um, and what was back then called uh, relay tokens, and then smart tokens, and now we know them as pool tokens. Um, and uh, the the project is um, you know it, it's still very much uh, concentrated around this idea of of liquidity and solving liquidity issues in um, in finance, and so the, um, the 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 major problems that that we are trying to solve are also the ones that we created, right? So with the AMM um, being sort of you know, first through the the gates into into DeFi, um, we were the first to discover uh, what its shortcomings are, and some of those shortcomings are things like. Um, opportunity cost and you know options with regards to uh, you know user choice in how they use their tokens, exposure to a permanent loss, um, and the the requirement to hold um, more than one asset that you might not otherwise want um, exposure to. So the the bank or Dex is really trying to figure out how uh, liquidity providers can guarantee to be you know have the guarantee of being rewarded for the service that they provide to DeFi without having to take on um, any sort of um, financial risk for the um, for, for the service that they are providing to DeFi. Awesome. Thank you so much for the quick introduction everyone. So let's just dive uh, right in into the panel discussion right now. So um, I mean, we have seen a lot of innovate, innovative products, you know, for the past few years, and we are seeing a lot more, you know, like popping up, like, you know, now and then. Uh, but in what areas do you see DeFi actually is disrupting or like, you know, like going to be disrupt? Yeah. I mean, because, you know, there's been a lot of institutional interest to, to want to integrate DeFi protocols to generate high yield for the customer. What do you think this means to like DeFi project? Yeah, so I think if uh, I'm happy to just start the conversation there. Sure. Yeah. Um, so where I see DeFi as as being sort of yeah. right now, um, it reminds me of this period in the in the 1990s when products like ING Direct started to release these things called online savings accounts, right? And at the time, it was like, you know, people were freaking out because they're like, you know, what is this thing? Is it a scam? There's no, you know, they don't give me a checkbook. I don't get an ATM card. Um, there's no branch, I, you know, how can I send my money to a bank account when there's no teller there to, to you know, hand me my money when I want to withdraw it? And I think that that's kind of the growing pain that, that DeFi is experiencing right now. And it's kind of the first, you know, user-facing uh, service of, of traditional financial products that DeFi is disrupting, because it's no uh, controversy to say that, you know, interest rates all over the world right now are, are, are abysmal. Um, and if you are, you know, if, if you have savings, the worst thing you can do with it right now is leave it in your bank. Um, especially in some places in the world right now, um, the, the interest rates have turned negative. So you actually have to relinquish some of the, your, your capital to the bank just for the, you know, um, for the, the burden of owning it. Um, and so that's the first part that the DeFi is disrupting. Um, but DeFi is, you know, is very much a part of the, the blockchain movement itself. And I would say that blockchains overall have a, a focus on um, removing incumbency, right, from from all of the the, um, the the different places where you might find it, and so and finance is riddled with it, right. So every time that we find a um, a, a broker that's taking a forty percent haircut from people that are you know trying to enter or exit from a particular position, that's something that DeFi can disrupt. Anytime that you've got someone who is paid, you know, two and a half million dollars a year just to prepare reports for financial earnings or something that you can just audit from a blockchain directly, that's something that DeFi can disrupt. So I think that we're really starting to see that, you know, um, yeah, wherever there is a useless middle person that is taxing uh, value mm -hmm. from the economy, that's something that DeFi is coming after and it's already coming after it. So I think that it's not, you know, what will DeFi disrupt? These are things that DeFi is already disrupting. Yeah. I, yeah. I, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Like the, 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 other, the other element to that is, the, is that it's causing this incredible competition, right? And like everyone abstractly knows that better, more competition should lead to better consumer results. 
but like people don't realize quite how uncompetitive the finance space is because of regulation, because of how difficult it is to build a financial institution. And what DeFi is representing is these, all of these teams coming in and being able to start essentially a financial product, financial institution as like two guys in a dorm room. And that like lots of them will fail, but some of them succeed and they create this incredible value. But that explosion of value comes from this ability to lower the barrier to entry and anyone to come in and try and build something. But then having it all on the same infrastructure, same like fundamental substrate so that capital can move seamlessly between them, that ability to like Bancor to be there where Uniswap is, to also be there where Aave is, to also be there where SushiSwap is, means that that, like, if you, you know, like Bancor V2, like, comes up with this next incredible model, suddenly capitals are made, able to move instantly to it. So the best ideas are constantly winning capital and that seamlessness and that competition is meaning that like the space of innovation is 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 incredible as a result of that competition. I think DeFi is instrumental in creating that as well. Yeah, so, I mean, as the two of you actually point out that, you know, like um, financial institutions, I think it's like, you know, um, in, uh, integrating like DeFi protocols, but are you, um, do you think they are actually ready for like, you know, like plugging into DeFi, you know, especially while, you know, um, you know, while we're talking to banks, you know, um, they are very much handcuffed by regulators. Um, and how do you see them actually plugging into DeFi then? Yeah, I mean, um, it, it really, yeah. it's it's going to be for, for a little while, this is going to be a project specific question. Um, mm -hmm. So that there are some protocols that are a lot more regulatory compliant than others. Um, yeah. You know, the, the Bancor has the advantage of, you know, being, you know, one of the older projects. It was established with a Swiss nonprofit that is very, um, very close to, to the Swiss regulator. Uh, who also makes sure that we, you know, remain compliant in the United States. We've also established a, a large amount of legal precedent for whether or not uh, BNT is considered a security. And for many projects, that's going to benefit them as well, because if their tokens have the same properties that BNT has, um, then they can, you know, uh, can lean on that legal precedent set in the United States. And, and that should help, um, you know, uh, integrations with banks and things like that. So you've already seen um, the some of the consequences for um, these uh, legal decisions where you know Swiss banks now accept BNT as you know uh, alongside uh, you know, alongside the euro in in their um, in their customers' bank accounts. So if you're if you're a, 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 a if you are an account holder in many Swiss banks right now, you can actually just buy and trade BNT from your online banking um, service. Um, there's also a, a very large collection of um, of private Swiss banks. Um, that are plugging directly into DeFi protocols, Bancor included, SushiSwap included, um, that are you know uh, being forced into DeFi in order to try and find better yields for their for their clients. And so it's not surprising that um, that I think that yes, absolutely, banks are, and and, tr and um, financial institutions are ready for this. Um, I think that the the question should actually be flipped a little bit. Um, I don't think that all protocols are ready for um, for financial and um, for regulated financial institutions to become involved with them. And certainly, Bancor has a long way to go. Right? I, I I don't think that we're ready for mainstream yet. I would say that the um, the protocols that have done the the best work um, preparing for this are um, things like Aave with their you know ring fenced um, Aave Pro protocol, and um, a I've seen a couple of other um, protocols do this. But it, it, you know, no one should be surprised that this is on the cards for you know for almost every um, uh, all, all of the the big, big DeFi protocols are going to have something like this, some sort of um, highly regulatory compliant version of itself. Um, specifically tailored to suit the needs of, of financial institutions because the demand is there, right? We talk to them every week. Um, they're waiting for us to, you know, to um, build out a, a new suite of resources specifically for them um, and also to make sure that the instruments that they're used to using are compatible with the protocols that we have because, you know, it, it might not be surprising that a, a lot of these financial institutions don't really want to trade things like, you know, wrapped Bitcoin or, Ethereum, they've got their own things. They want to do, you know, um, overnight, um, overnight interbank lending um, on on blockchains. They don't want to, you know, uh, necessarily just buy and sell cryptocurrencies. 
So DeFi is, is, you know, is absolutely going to have to work hard, I think, to make sure that all of the things that financial institutions already do, um, they can do with us. Um, and they are ready for it. I, I'm, I'm not so sure that we are ready for them. Yeah, I mean, I that's think, a good point. You know, yeah. I would say, um, so I smiled a little bit earlier when we talked about recreating like the financial primitive and the stack and the rent seeking entities. Um, I spent roughly a decade at Goldman before joining Terra and, you know, a lot of that sounds familiar. Um, <laughs> you know, I would, I would say um, what, what Mark was mentioning as well, though, in terms of um, financial institutions, they're definitely, you know, looking into this space, right? So late last year, JP Morgan announced JPM coin and obviously um, Goldman and other entities at that scale are doing things similar internally in terms of figuring out how to incorporate blockchain technologies. Um, so to the point of, you know, whether it be reverse repo transactions overnight or um, other ways in which you can leverage some of the pure like technical benefits of blockchain. That said, I think, you know, DeFi is, is a different beast because it really creates a totally different like risk reward profile that's just not available um, in traditional finance. And a lot of that is just being powered by sovereign monetary policy of um, separate, you know, layer one chains, let's say, um, that traditional um, monetary policy can't really compete with at the moment. So um, I think it'll be interesting to see what approach institutions take. For instance, as we mentioned earlier, um, some of the larger institutions may be most interested in incorporating just the distributed ledger and blockchain technology, whereas different divisions of the same institution, let's say private wealth management or wealth, um, institutional management may actually want to invest, right? And buy BNT or um, other crypto coins. So I think it'll be interesting to see which areas um, the demand comes from. Um, but in the long run, you know, we're already seeing Again, like Mark alluded to earlier, some projects trying to find find the fine balance. So um, I think we've seen projects trying to connect liquidity and DeFi into financing real world assets, um, and we're seeing other projects that are um, you know creating creative tools to connect to uh, traditional finance. So we'll see where this leads, but I would think that um, DeFi is here to stay, and and TradFi will continue to adopt. All right, sounds good. Um, so, anything like, to add? The man. Yeah, in terms, I was just gonna say, in terms of how I think DeFi is gonna really like make an impact, and I think it's gonna happen a lot with like an emergence of DAOs and and DAOs that we wouldn't have necessarily thought would take off like in this way, such as you know with, with the increased popularity of social tokens. So um, with like Miso and like our upcoming. NFT platform show you like one of the big pushes is to you know get these artists to create a new revenue stream uh, via you know fundraising for a social token and you know revenue sharing with their fans and this is not like I guess only available to like NFT artists it could be exactly what I said influencers and yeah it's just going to like really shake up the industry in that way and then I guess because people sort of going off to this question too, but how I'm thinking it's gonna, uh, we're gonna react with TradeFi, uh, sorry, TradFi is like, we had this proposal up uh, a couple months ago about something called these like franchise pools where, uh, you know, we can help create like another revenue stream for these uh, traditional financial firms where they use their own UX UI and they're able to uh, take their clients' assets and invest them into like liquidity pools for them. And I think that it would be a great way to kind of marry uh, like the DeFi community with these more traditional firms. Okay. So while we, are, while we have been talking about traditional financial institutions, you know, like um, dabbling into DeFi space, but um, you know, do you think that DeFi ecosystem is actually made for just big players or like, you know, like big whales and um and obviously because of you know of the high gas fees on the Ethereum network, um, you know, um there have been quite a bit of conversations around, you know, like uh protocols, DeFi protocols are really made for like big players. Uh so what do you how do you think we can actually uh or what what can we do to actually include like small players as well? Like, you know, uh, uh Piers, would you like to 
take this question. I, I, I think, I yeah. think it's, it's, a, it's, it's a real problem for the space, yeah. like the, the way in which we are being exclusionary to small to small people coming in and playing around with it and it's not even yeah. it's not even just small amounts of capital like yeah. some people have a lot of savings that they could put into DeFi, but that first being like oh it cost me a hundred bucks in fees to do something yeah that, that's not that, that that's not acceptable i think that you know one of the reasons that we built radix was to solve this problem but i you know there's lots of great people in the space who are trying to do good things to, to reduce the cost of using these the, the, this technology. But that's only the first step. Like I always talk about, um, and Mark mentioned this idea of like the 1990s internet. It's a really good analogy. We haven't yet had our Netscape Navigator moment. So like the actual experience of using DeFi, even if you remove the, the, the how uh, expensive it is, is still terrifying to the casual user, like MetaMask as an experience, private key ownership as an experience, like having to understand that there are different ledgers and there are different ways of securing yourself. The often the, the frequency in which you can get scammed or hacked and how difficult that is to protect yourself against if you're not on crypto Twitter all of the time and not always hanging out in communities. Um, that's going to get, I think that, that is needs to improve as well. Like one of the big reasons that I think good fire is so important is this educational purpose of actually giving people a safe, safe sp starting space but i think the industry itself is going to need to get better at presenting really easy to use user experiences that's going to mean that we can breach this current like early adopter bleeding edge community into people who are just like i don't have a weekend to sit and read all of this stuff i just want to know that when i when i click this button my money's safe and it's gone somewhere and I'm then going to, you know, get a return. So there's these outsized returns that are attracting high risk profiles. But for us to get serious about breaching into the mainstream, this like there's big parts of security and user experience that needs to be improved as well, which is, you know, big things that Radix is working on. But beyond that, I think that there's a really interesting, like, almost dichotomy between us going, right, what we're doing is we're getting rid of intermediaries, but we're also trying to cater towards institutionals. I, I Like there is a inherent like um, weird thing. Normally, yeah, there are normally, institutionals are normally intermediaries of other people's capital. Yeah. And I think the point of these structures is to try and disintermediate, trying to give people more ways in which they can directly have their capital allocated within a system that gives them good returns and safety without having to have these intermediaries in the first place. But until that occurs, the institutional conversation is really useful for us to understand better on how better to work with regulators. Because I think what we used to do as a space is go, no, regulation bad, crypto not regulated, here's a, here's a space that's outside of regulation. Now what we're realizing is that the, the, it's sort of like levels of abstraction. You can have a permissionless system, but you can have a permissionless system that's, look, that's highly like attack resistant that's a good thing but you can still have a permissioned like little garden on top of it and i think what we're going to see next after Arve's like uh Arve pro experiment and and what bank working on next on all that kind of stuff which i'm assuming rather than knowledge here um is i think that we're going to start to see connections of these gardens and you'll see spaces that are regulatory compliant and spaces that aren't and then ways in which these things can all bridge together and the more complicated that becomes the more commercial the entire thing can become but also the more accessible to the end user as well i think it's all about bridging the user experience and the capital markets together to create the best possible financial infrastructure um and and that's going to take us a while right this is long long-term goals i think that the um the, ethereum has earned its reputation as the the rich person's blockchain right the, the, if you tried to do anything last year, you were paying thousands of dollars of gas, um, you know, on a, on a daily basis. And I, I agree with Pierce, it's completely unacceptable, but it's also, I, it's a very immature, you know, technology where it, we're not really at the stage yet where, you know, there are uh, DeFi protocols advertising on TV spots or a drama Super Bowl or something. We're starting to see that that's changing a little bit, right? You know, the crypto space has started to become a little bit more mainstream. Crypto.com just recently had a, an ad at the um, at, a, at a fighting tournament of some kind. So it's becoming a little bit more mainstream, but we've still got this 
you know, growing and, you know, learning about ourselves process to, to, to get through before we have to worry about these things. But I think that there, there was a lot more insight than just um, how much it costs to use blockchains in what Pierce was saying. And I agree with him. Um, I think that this, um, the, the, uh, the Netscape Explorer analogy was a good one. Um, I, I've, I'm thoroughly convinced that eventually um, for, for DeFi to work specifically, users shouldn't even be aware which blockchain they're using. Right. At the moment, this is a very big, you know, yep. thing within within the community. It's like people get excited about like the launch of Avalanche, and so they should. It's a terrific blockchain. They got super excited for Polygon, and so they should, right? It alleviated a huge amount of congestion from Ethereum. But the regular person, right? We're not just talking about how expensive it is in terms of their money to use Ethereum, but most people don't have the fucking time. Right to to learn about all of these things and how to use them. Even as you know, an industry professional, every time there's a new blockchain that I now have to go and investigate, I get like you know I have to go and make a coffee and work out how do I you know what's the bridge you know protocol for for moving funds between them? Does it even you know accept Ethereum? Do I have to do something else? I remember the first time I tried to use XDAI, it took me like a whole day to um, just to work out what what I was supposed to do to get on there. Um, and, you know, this is my job. Uh, I do this every single day. And so to expect regular people to have not just the, the wealth of capital to be able to use to use blockchains right now, but the wealth of time to be able to sit down and educate yeah. themselves at the same time that, that people are constantly fishing for people doing this for the first time so that they can exploit them. There are so many problems that aren't just, you know, capital, um, you know, related to how much money people have for using blockchains. There, there are other barriers that are equally important. And I, I, I think that Pierce summed it up very well. I just wanted to, to reiterate some of those points. Yeah, totally. I mean, like, you know, apart from, um, you know, just network scalability issues, you know, where it requires a lot of gas fees if, you know, like people pay like, you know, thousands of gas fees just to, you know, like yolk farm or like, uh, you know, to, to be involved in like D5 protocols. I mean, like I do see like security issues as well. So, um, 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 SJ or you know Amanda, would you like to take this question? So, what is your thought on um, security issues, and what do you think we can actually do to you know just to you know like make sure that you know like funds are not hacked? You know, like what happened to Poly Network? You know that, um, that yeah that, that the recent Poly Network uh, Network hack like two weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's you know a byproduct of just everything being very early, right? Um, mm. And if I can go back to the point earlier, actually on DeFi as well, um, to what Pierre said and Mark said as well, um, I, I think it's the same point of us being very early. Um, at the same time, I think, you know, if you look at, it kind of depends on which spectrum of DeFi we're talking about, because there's definitely products out there um, that abstract away the blockchain from users, if you will. Um, so, you know, we, we create a Chai, which is like an e-payment uh, wallet or, e-wallet or payment gateway in Korea. And we currently have you know, two and a half million users who use it without even realizing that they're interacting with a stable coin or a blockchain. Mm -hmm. um, and some of our community members are building something similar. And obviously um, it's happening on other chains too. Um, so I think to the extent that layer two solutions, to the extent that the future is kind of interchain, we'll see a lot of ways in which some of the constraints that are imposed in, in the DeFi ecosystem right now will be solved for. Um, and then, yeah, going back to the security issue, I think it really is, you know, up to the community and up to up to all of DeFi to really get stronger around that. So whether it be taking security very seriously, testing things in and out, um, having strong like bug bounty programs, um, you know, auditing in and out, you know, it's something that we'll just have to continue to iterate to get better at. Um, unfortunately, you know, the opportunities are so grand here, right? That I think we'll continue to have people who try to exploit. Um, but I do think that this is just kind of the growing pains of fuel of a thriving ecosystem and something that we'll be solving for in the near future. And maybe as a, like a product of this technology being so immature uh, is also the fact that, you know, DeFi is at a stage right now where we have so much pressure to, ship products so fast just yep. because the competition's so fierce like at sushi we are shipping new features every three months 
like we've, as I mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, we have like four different products that would come up in less than, well, in a year. So it's just insane how fast. And I was asking one of our like core developers about, you know, like in a traditional business, how long would a, just a feature uh, like this take? I can't remember which one, maybe like a, a limit order style feature. How, how long would that take? It goes maybe about two years in you know traditional business because not only are they you know jumping through internal hoops of um getting permissions but also as uh, sj just mentioned as well like there is so much auditing and testing and you know we all do our best but um just because these technologies are so new there are just so many like potential exploits that like as with the best intentions and the best auditors at your uh, or in your pocket there are just like so many uh, different scenarios that you might not have come up with. Just be, again, because this technology is, is so new. Okay, so I think uh, going, going forward, lots of testing, as SG said. I, I, think I, I, I think there are longer term solutions here as well. Like we are still building on a very immature language and a very mature, very immature VM. So it's like solidity hasn't really changed that much from when it was first proposed. And that's because it's very difficult to change that sort of the way it works um, once the, the immutable ledger is set up, especially in the way that the Ethereum was built and the EVM, the Ethereum virtual machine, again, like that, a lot of that is actually exposing issues. Like one of the, the what, you know, one of the things that Redix is doing is building a new language uh, and a new execution environment, specifically for decentralized finance, to try and massively reduce the number of ways you can make mistakes um, in, in just how you program and, and, and the attack services that's represented by the functionality when you have to do things like auditing, which what we hope that will do is, is actually make it easier to build things more securely, which will lower the barriers to entry for new people coming in, but we hope will also reduce the burden on teams trying to build in the first place. Because I think there is like lots of layers to the stack. There's the, ex, the, there's the, there's the, sec, the throughput that needs to be improved. But then there's the way that we build that needs to be improved. And then there's the user experience that needs to be improved. And a lot of people talk about the user experience and the, and the scalability, but that middle bit is actually causing huge amounts of problems for people. Like, I, I don't know what your audit bill is for Sushi, but I'm assuming it's not negligible. And the same for Bancor. And I think that's a burden in the DeFi space that's happening a lot as well. And is in stopping more innovation from happening. Plus, I agree, this insane speed that people are expecting things to be delivered at also causes more issues and causes more mistakes. And, 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 and that we need to find some way in which we can come together as communities and understand that good things take time. And that's often a difficult narrative to push, which I think is just part of the whole crypto mentality. But sometimes when you look at it from a long way, that's sort of why crypto has moved really fast, but really slow at the same time. Some things just like are the same they were 10 years ago, and they're still sort of crazy that they're like that. And it's partly because no one's willing to stop and like, do the hard engineering work it's just like no we have to do this we have to do this we have to do this and it's all iterative and little things um which is why i think like what you know te what terror has built is so interesting and going wow like stable coins are so integral to the system we want to make it like as part of how the ecosystem works and there's this amazing feedback loop experiment going on and like you know bancor has started the 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 uh, constant function market maker and it's just been constantly like long-term building new functionality as well and like what sushi is doing is, is is awesome um but it's all like different speeds of innovation that have to happen all together for us to be able to mature this industry both in terms of what could work but also what needs to be changed at like an engineering level for this to be mature enough for the world to trust their finances on top of these lenders. I think that there's um, it, it's important to acknowledge that when we talk about security in in DeFi it doesn't mean one thing right there, there's all there's things like smart contract security and uh, absolutely what Amanda was referring to is, is 1000% correct. The pressure to constantly produce stuff is overwhelming more than, you know, not just the, the sense that, um, that the space is moving so quickly, but compared to other businesses, our, uh, we interface with our, you know, communities on a daily basis, right? They are in our, in our emails, in our Twitter accounts, in your face 24 um, seven, <laughs> asking you what the next thing is, you know, um, you know, telling you their ideas and it's, it's great, right? I, I wouldn't trade it for anything, 
but it, it does mean that you, you do feel this, this pressure to, to release stuff more quickly. And it, it means that managing your community's expectations, when we say something like, guys, stop asking when V3 is going to be released, we'll tell you when it's ready, because if we rush it, there's you know, billions of dollars on the line. And we, we just don't want to take that risk. So there's that kind of smart contract risk. And, and certainly, I think managing community expectations and also you know, treating developers um, with, with respect and giving them the time they need to do things right um, is also um, important. Um, and uh, I'm sure uh, you know, Amanda will, will, will tell you, um, auditors are completely overwhelmed right now. Right? You, if you want to get a contract audited, you better have booked it in, you know, back in, in April. Um, and that's a huge problem. I really don't think that there is enough um, auditing expertise and um, availability. Um, and we're already seeing what the, the consequences of that are, right? I'm not, I don't want to mention any auditing firms uh, by name. Everyone in this call knows who they are. Um, but the ones that are the most overwhelmed, the most, you know, um, over inundated with, with audits are the ones that are now showing up consistently with hacked projects that they gave a rubber stamp to. So the, it, it is a huge problem. Smart contract risk is a problem, but it's not the only security risk that we face for, um, especially in DeFi um, and, you know, with these uh, new tokenomics models and things like that. There's also an economic security risk where um, we're now playing around with really brand new financial and economic ideas. And a lot of them are very good, but a lot of them are, are, are pretty untested. Um, and so, you know, with, with Bank Core's version 2.1, we were really, you know, um, you know, I, I want to say that we were quite disciplined in the way that we, we launched the protocol out. We, we deliberately kept the TVL small for as long as possible. Um, we, we, you know, we wanted to make sure that the, the model was behaving in, in the real world the same way it behaved in simulations. And I think a lot of naive project developers aren't doing that. Right? They develop something on paper or, or on a whiteboard, and then they launch it out into the world um, without really having a good understanding of, of what its behavior is going to be. And the algorithmic stablecoins, for example, is a really good example of this. Right? Things that can, um, can end up permanently depegged um, and you know, uh, end up upsetting a lot of people, including you know, prominent billionaires. Um, who then start worrying about <laughs> regulatory involvement for the first time. You know, the, 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 these kinds of security risks are, are, are a thing. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure SJ will have something, um, you know, insightful to say about this because there was a period there where Terra's stablecoin was being looked at with, you know, with great attention. And, you know, luckily it, it, it had the resilience um, to, to, to prove its mettle. Um, but it just goes to show that, you know, whenever that, that doubt starts to creep in, people start realizing, you know what, DeFi has this a huge amount of uncertainty associated with it that has nothing to do with smart contract risk. There's an entirely different kind of risk there. And you may as well call it a security risk. And so I, I, I get uncomfortable when we talk about security in DeFi treating it all like it all fits under one umbrella because they're very different things. You can have an airtight contract with extremely questionable um, economics, and you can have something that it has, you know, rock solid economics, but you know, a, a ham fisted execution on solidity. And so, it, it, they are two different discussions, and I think they need to be handled as two separate discussions. Yeah. So, I mean, to your point, right? Um, regulators start, you know, like I mean, because of all this different complexity or different layers. Uh, uh, different layers of risk, um, you know, like regulators started to actually, you know, like, um, you know, paying a lot more attention to like DeFi space. So do you think, you know, like, author I mean, like authorities or like regulators around the world can actually uh, regulate DeFi or like, you know, or even should they, you know, because, uh, you know, some said that, you know, they might um, stifle uh, innovation. So um, yeah, question for everyone. Yeah, I'll, if you guys don't mind, I'll, I'll answer this one quickly because I, I recorded a podcast just earlier today and I said something to the effect of, I really do think that um, that the entire cryptocurrency movement, DeFi in particular, can cooperate with, with regulators. There's no reason to assume that it, it shouldn't be able to do that. Um, you know, when regulators say things like investors should be protected and, you know, that there should be some minimum level of, you know, vetting um, when something enters out into the world before it attracts billions of dollars investment, I think these are all very sane asks. And, um, you know, anyone who says that, that that's unreasonable or that is, you know, just a, 
a, a government trying to shoehorn it, itself into a you know a system where it doesn't belong. I, I think that that's a, a naive uh, counter argument. However, I, I do think that, that a couple of things need to happen before cryptocurrency can be, uh, you know, and DeFi can be effectively regulated. And one is, I would really like to see governments start to acknowledge that they had a, it was their incompetency that had a hand in the creation of DeFi in the first place, right? That there needs to be a, a very thorough revision of the failures of, of, of the old regulatory uh, method um, that isn't introduced into DeFi because it's just going to pollute it again and we're going to end up with DeFi version 2.0 and we're just going to end up in a, you know, a, a constant cycle of people constantly outpacing the regulator. And I promise you, governments are the slowest moving entities in the world. I've worked for governments many times um, and they will never be able to, uh, to keep up with what, what private investors and private developers are doing. So if they want to regulate DeFi, I think that they're going to have to relinquish some of the um strangle hold that they have on on how the on how these um instruments operate and uh, uh, you know give it a little bit of, of rope and at the same time i think that the cryptocurrency community needs to concede that this shit needs to be regulated <laughs> you know that the, there are occasionally you know um you know at the moment there are hundreds of billions of dollars on the line um but if this goes how i think it will eventually there might be upwards of a quadrillion dollars on the line um and some of uh, when you end up with that level of, of capital, um, one, um, the, the capacity to bankrupt the whole world becomes a, a legitimate concern. Um, and also things like, you know, making sure that if you are uh, trading with someone or earning money with someone in the same protocol, that it isn't, you know, uh, accidentally funding the Taliban or something. Um, it is legitimate concern, especially if you're like, you know, uh, if you're held to the standards that the Commonwealth Bank of Australia is or that HSBC is, although they take money from, you know, drug cartels. So I, maybe that's a bad example. But you know what I mean, right? It's um, I think that regulation is a positive thing and we should embrace it reluctantly with certain conditions. And, and I think that that's reasonable. I'm really curious as to what the terror view on this is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I would say, um, I think to the extent that regulation is thoughtful and there's healthy debate, you know, that's that's totally fine. And that's um, something that we want as well, because I think to the extent that we we envision a future where our stable coins or the terror economy is flourishing, um, I think it's not necessarily, um, you know, in contradiction to where regulators are, right? So I think to the extent that for, for all of DeFi to really flourish, Mark's right, like there needs to be some um, healthy dialogue and also clarity on, on what's allowed or what's not allowed, what's not allowed and why. I think the problem that we're having is um, one, there's lack of clarity because regulators are trying to be thoughtful um, and trying to create um, a dialogue that makes you know, most sense. Um, but also, you know, to Mark's point, I think a lot of ways in which regulators have tried to um, protect households have also kind of kept a lot of opportunities from them. And I think DeFi is unlocking a lot of that potential. So um, there's naturally some collision there. And I think, um, you know, the progress that we make over the next year or two, especially with the new um, uh, administration and regulatory bodies will be helpful to see the forward trajectory of, of DeFi. But, you know, like what we'd like to say is, you know, progress can't really be stopped. I, I think to the extent that um, there is further pressure, I think that may actually galvanize DeFi even more. So it'll be interesting to see where, where we get to. I think, I think there's, there's two, there's two principles we operate on anyway. The, um, the first is that um, regulation can create a, a scenario of nanny state, right? Like as in you, the, the, a good example of this in America is the, is the um, sophisticated investor rules. Like if you have over a certain amount of money, you're allowed to buy these products. And if you don't, you don't. Now, like from the point of view of an easy thing to measure, Sure, that makes sense. Like the regulators gone, like, how are we going to make sure that people are going to get screwed over? But the thing is, is like the amount of money you have doesn't have any real view on your level of sophistication. And like what it ends up doing is just 
treating people like children. No, you can't have that. You're not clever enough. And the way we measure that is how much money you have is like the worst kind of statements. But then there's like the the jurisprudence or the just the concepts of justice that the regulators are trying to enforce, which is like, don't screw people over, give everyone fair and full information, like make sure that material stuff is disclosed in a proper way. Don't act like an insider and trade on things that you can make profit on and other people can't ahead of the market. Like basically don't be a dick. Right. And I think that crypto can learn a lot from the concepts of just don't be a dick and be a good person in how you're like, think of yourself as the same level stakeholder as everyone else and try and operate at like that when it comes to opportunities to make profit, opportunities to make money and like try and avoid this tendency that we do where like the crypto universe was like, ah, oh, we don't like insiders and we don't like the people who get to profit from like insider and then like does everything that like regulation came into in the like 1970s and 1980s like that's the reason that we have this like really hardcore regulation so if we want to if we want to like fight regulation i think we're fighting the things that tend towards nannyism stop treating people like children they're not children they're adults and but at the same time don't be a dick like think about how you would want to actually if you were not you but was someone else outside of your company or your team or your or your group or whatever it was would you want you to behave would you want you to be behaving in that way or would you want you to be behaving in a different way and i think if those two things happen where people are not dicks and that we push against the principles of nannyism rather than like um, we don't want to get regulated for no, for any reason. How dare you like infringe on our on our rights? I think we actually can end up with a good dialogue with the regulators because that's what the regulators try and do at the end of the day. It's just they 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 don't understand the yep. technology and they're being very very like heavy handed in what yep. they're doing. Yeah, I mean, I don't have a question for Amanda though. Like, I mean, being you know the new kid on the block, <laughs> do you have a compliance or legal department that deals with like regulators? Um, you know, like. Uh, I just wanted to start off by saying I'm going to be the first member of Don't Be a Dick Dow. <laughs> Pierce is too Dow. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, for sushi, you know, because we are a Dow, I think I agree with what everyone's saying. It would be, it seems like an unstoppable force, but I would be really interested to see how like regulatory bodies would come up with laws for something of that size and of this, uh, the intricate nature of it. And yeah, just being, uh, I guess we don't have any one per se, like a legal team, but, you know, we have so many contributors, I'm sure we've got lots of people with their own hot takes and uh, who have like, you know, intricately, they're intimately familiar with the law. But uh, in my personal experience with uh, sushi, I haven't really heard much of regulation. I'm but yeah, excited to see what the, what the future holds. Like, I'm sure everyone's open to it and I'm sure it'll be like a really interesting dialogue because that seems very, very complicated. And if things go as slow as Mark said, I wonder how long it would take to come up with laws for DAOs. Has Sushi ever like contemplated doing permission pools like Aave's doing? Is that, was that ever a, even a conversation in your, in your community? To the best of my knowledge, no. Interesting, okay. Okay. I want to drop an interesting anecdote here, and that's the, that's how that's what Bancor version one started as, right? The very first AMM was 100% KYC AML compliant because our legal advice was you're an exchange, right? And you're going to be held to the same laws that all exchanges are. So if you wanted to start at a liquidity pool when Bancor first launched, we, you know, you called us on the phone and we sent you the forms. Right. And they, that needs to get signed and rubber stamped for you to actually get the liquidity pool set up. So it's kind of interesting to see, you know, I, I consider this uh, this recent period, right, of, um, you know, that kind of began with the the, um, the awesome success of, of, of Uniswap and SushiSwap is like we're kind of exploring, right, exactly uh, how much rope regulators will let us have. And it's been great. Right. I'm so glad. <laughs> That um, that we had a, an example to follow in that you know we can we can you know be that courageous and and um, and try it out and and see you know and see what happens. Um, but I do think that it's going to be an oscillation, right? There are going to be times where 
we move between being super liberal like we are right now and then it comes back in, into sort of more conservative you know legally and, re and regulatory conservative times and then you know swings back the other way just as you know just as everything does um, and so it is nice to be in one of those kind of uh, liberal upswings um, but I do think that, um, that the conservative downswing is coming and I don't mean that in any you know I, I'm not saying that that reflects the health of the market in any way I'm just mean that um, you know, governments have been kind of hands off for, for a long time. And so it, we're kind of overdue to, to get some, you know, some meddling. And so they'll meddle for a little while and then they'll be hands off again. And this will continue in cycles forever. Awesome. Thanks for the interesting insights on regulation. <laughs> and um, so, um, so that brings me to, you know, the core of the topic of the discussion for today. So in what way do you think we can help to actually, uh, you know, like attract more users to DeFi, basically, you know, like achieving 100 million DeFi users uh, by year 2025, which is like four years from now. Yep. Anyone? Uh, so, yeah, so like, <laughs> I, I think I think that it is, I always have this analogy when it comes to this, and it's that in the early days of the internet, getting people to get online was really difficult, right? Because what you had to do is you had to convince them to buy a computer. Because most people, like in the early days, not a lot of people had a computer, especially not a desktop computer that they just use casually, uh, unless you're a business, but like a family home computer. And then the next thing you need to do was convince them to connect to the internet, which in some cases meant giving up your, your phone line, and, other, and like, but it definitely meant paying someone to come in and install the internet. Internet install, installation wasn't free. It'd be like you're really, like, you're really dating yourself here. <laughs> right. And then, and then, really and then, and then after, and then, and then, and you had to convince them to use this new piece of software called a web browser, where none of the stuff that we're used to is like as intuitive, like I know that the burger icon means that that's where the option menu is. And I know that the X means I can close it. And I know that this bit here is where I can type and this bit here I can't. Like all of that took education and promotion and like, and, 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 and basically every single person has got their own set of interests. The internet is a thing that you can do anything on. But like that statement is so hard to put your hands around because you're like, well, I, I, I don't even, I can't imagine what that means. What does anything mean? I mean, I, I don't have a frame of reference. And so, you know, what, what we're trying to do with GoodFi and what I think the per what everyone needs to do in the space is help people take that first step you don't have to put in $10,000. You can just put in a few dollars. Now, not on Ethereum, obviously. You know, go use go use Terra, go use Radix, go use something else that's a bit more scalable. But fundamentally, put your first, put your first dollar in, put your first couple of dollars in and just learn the tools because this is one of the things that I do with my team all the time is when we have new people come in, I'm like, here's 500 bucks. Go play with DeFi. Just, just like, because... It's really hard to explain, but if you go and use Bancor, you like suddenly you're like, oh, I get it. I, I have this asset, I can put it in and I start making money. Look, I can see the money start. And like, there's this aha moment that comes from actually just experimenting. And that experimentation creates evangelism and evangelism creates a movement. And that movement grows if there's truth to it. And that, that, that truth is becoming self-evident, the way in which the yields are improving, the way in which the user experience is improving, the way the choice is improving, the number of thing, any things you can now actually do. And so like the way that we get to 100 million users is by starting with 100,000 really, really, really like excited ones who don't just stay in an echo chamber and go, isn't they so great? Yeah, oh, DeFi is great, we're so great, we should just stay here all the time. And like go and tell other people about it and bring them in and that's already happening, but there does need to be help. There does need to be safe spaces. Like goodfi.com has been created as the starting point of those safe spaces, but then like actually building more visibility of it amongst communities, amongst friends and getting that education and getting people like willing to hold hands and help people out is probably the single most important thing now because it isn't it isn't about total assets we will eat the world eventually it's about users understanding and being able to evangelize about this space that will create that long-term you know quadrillion dollars onto DeFi in the long run so that's why it's 100 million users not like some 
dollar value, I think. Okay. An observation that I'm, I'm really excited to share with, with Amanda, actually, because of the, the marketing implications that, that it has. But it, it's very similar to what, what Pierce was just saying about in the, in the beginnings of the, of the internet, right? It was extremely difficult to get people to use a computer. And it's not necessarily that a computer was too expensive or that, you know, and, and, you know they were expensive, but it, it's not because they were expensive that it was difficult to get them to use it. It's because technological literacy was very bad in the, in the late 80s and early 90s. And so what you end up having is this kind of generational lag time where you need this kind of, you know, the, the people that are, are born in that era of that technology of that technology being available. And they're the ones that in their teenage years kind of make it widespread. Yep. Right. So it was really Gen Y that was the or I'm a, I think they get lumped into the millennials now, but, but it was Gen Y. It was really like, you know, they were called the digital natives. Right. They grew up with computers. They grew up with the Internet. Yep. They knew what it means. They know how to use it. And it's because and it's, as soon as they start getting jobs that all of a sudden it explodes um, and, the, and the, the industry becomes a success. Um, we often in, I find in DeFi circles, certainly within the community, we say things like, how would you describe DeFi to your grandmother or your mother or something? And yeah. I, I, I'm like <laughs> that you're never going to win that battle. No one in history has ever won that battle. No new technology has ever been adopted by like the octogenarians of the period. What you're looking for is how do you make it available to the people that are being born at the time that that technology becomes available, right? So I, I got, I'm not seeing DeFi as being something that my mother is ever going to learn to use, right? She can barely use a DVD remote. Um, if I try and get her to use a, you know, a, a, a ledger uh, or, you know, a MetaMask, like, forget it. it it's never going to happen. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's kind of where... where my feeling is that, but we're facing a different problem now, right? Because DeFi is not a technological literacy problem. We now have a financial literacy problem, right? We, it, it used to be that, you know, new technologies come out and all you have to do is read the instruction manual or grow up using it. And, it, and it's like, okay, I, I know how to do it. But really we, we're in this weird period in human civilization where for like the past 80 years, there have been this one section of, of professionals who are responsible for all of the world's finances. And unless you um, have been, you know, uh, have made the deliberate choice to become exposed to it at university level, you never, you never even learn about it, right? You, no one talks about what, you know, um, you know, how interest is, is calculated or, or what it means at, at high school, right? There is no, you know, introduction to finance, or at least where, where I grew up, there was no introduction to finance class. You know, we were taught useless things like, you know, geography and, and music. I don't know, maybe that's controversial, but there, there should have been a class for this is what financial, you know, this, these are what basic financial principles mean, and this is how you apply them. And that, for me, is the biggest challenge for DeFi is because you are no longer entrusting some industry professional to make good financial decisions. You're now trusting individuals to make good financial decisions. And that is a huge education burden. And I think that we're going to have to start having the same sorts of conversations that we were having during the internet boom, which is shit, maybe we should be teaching kids how to use computers in school, right? We're now going to have to start having these conversations where, okay, maybe we, we're going to need a, a class for people to, you know, audit smart token contracts and work out whether or not the economics make any sense. Um, I, I actually do think that this is where we're headed. Um, and that is the thing, that is the number one, you know, uh, bottleneck to DeFi being a, an everyone on the planet sort of technology. But I, I'm really interested to hear from Amanda on this because this is the sort of thing that we struggle with internally with our marketing campaigns, that we're not just selling a technology, we're also trying to, you know, once you bring people in, you then need to start teaching them what exchange rates are. Yeah, I really liked uh, Pierce's analogy um, with, with the, you know, first one in the internet, but then I tended to just agree with you a tiny bit more, Mark, that it's not as much of like a tech, uh, sorry, a technological literacy issue, but I also don't really think it's too much of a financial literacy issue. Of course, when we get into things like lending, margin trading, that's a completely different story and some of the more complex uh, and DeFi financial tools, like maybe even staking, but if we look at you know a DEX and performing swaps, buying and selling assets, I think if we just think of it in that very very primitive way, I think the tech sorry the financial literacy is there. Everyone can understand what that is. 
swapping assets, it's very simple, but I think the number one thing, and this is like a common rhetoric in like a sushi community is that the UI of all these different amazing products is so foreign. So the whole process of these transactions are just so foreign. And that's, I think one of the upcoming features that we're trying to tackle or uh, sorry, one of the problems that we're trying to tackle with our upcoming AMM Trident, which is depositing assets into our token vault and keeping them there and then performing all these other transactions, which I think is, you know, what people might be more similar to. I know this is very like sushi uh, focused, but yeah, I think just making things more or like the process of transactions, just a lot more familiar. And that also includes like UI standardization. Like we have, you know, these little petty rivalries that are really fun for crypto Twitter, but like truly, truly, like we just want mass adoption. Everyone here is like trying to, you know, it sounds kind of cringe, but trying to like change the world. So it would just be a lot easier if we're on the same page. And uh, if, yeah, UI were, was standardized, then we would have a lot more people become familiar a lot more quickly. I, I'm right. glad you brought up the, the petty rivalry part as well, because I think that this is another thing is that cryptocurrency still has this lingering chip on its shoulder, you know, toxic, you know, cannibalistic mentality where, you know, if people are discovering cryptocurrency for the first time, it can be extremely confronting and unwelcoming, right? <laughs> you know, uh, and, and I, I think that if, if we, we tell ourselves all the time that we want mass adoption, but the first thing that we do is berate everyone when they're coming through the door, I, it's not a, you know, it, it's like the worst welcoming party in the, in the world. Uh, and I think that this is something that, uh, you know, as as leaders within the um, the industry is something yeah. that we should probably shoulder a little bit more responsibility for. Um, certainly, I, you know, I've been guilty of this when a community member thinks it's fun to to poke fun at a, you know, um, a, another protocol's uh, expense. Certainly there's, you know, a, a guilty schadenfreude sort of event when a, um, a, a competing, you know, uh, protocol uh, loses some TBL or heavens forbid gets exploited, um, you know, that they want to poke fun at them in Twitter. And I, I, I it, it, in the beginning, I was like, yeah, that's, that's fun. That's funny. This is kind of how the industry operates. But now I'm thinking, guys, don't do that. You know, send, send sympathies, ask people if they're okay. You know, it, it, we really need to start treating each other, not like this is a 4chan discussion forum and yep. really start treating people like this is a, a financial professional environment because it is increasingly becoming one. And the longer we look like, you know, children throwing tantrums, the longer governments are going to be treating us that way. Yeah, yeah that's I mean, very think, well said. Um, sorry, yeah, I, I just want to say, I think, you know, the next 100 million users will, will come. I think it's, it's definitely going to happen. And I think the way in which it happens is to, to what everybody said, better UI, UX, better education, um, and just making sure that there's access, right? The whole point of DeFi is democratization and lowering the bars for access to everyone. And I think all of us and in, in all of our respective teams are trying to do that and working for that goal. You know, what, what makes me personally like incredibly bullish is all this is happening at the same time as like the greatest wealth transfer in history, right? So in terms of there being a generational um, transition, if you will, um, that's definitely in play in tandem to a change in technology and what um, crypto allows. I do think that, you know, NFTs are here to stay, the metaverses are here to stay, and hopefully those can be kind of lower barriers to entry to getting people acclimated to what DeFi can, um, can do for them. Um, and, you know, we're happy to be working on some of these projects internally too, but I do think that we, it's, it's definitely, um, um, bubbly and it feels like uh, there's a lot of speculation, but I do hope that there's a lot of culture that gets brought into the Web 3.0 as well. And that brings in additional users as well that may not have been, you know, um, excited about yield aggregators or AMM Rexes or stable coins, right? Um, but to the extent that we, we can bring on the next millions of users through some of these other verticals, I think that's um, to our advantage too. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, totally agree with Piers and SJ about, you know, it's a collective effort, you know, for everyone within the ecosystem to build that, you know, friendly environment for new entrants. I mean, um, you know, uh, it is already 
uh, daunting enough to actually, you know, just start to, you know, like open up a wallet uh, and, you know, not to mention, you know, basically doing swapping of tokens and uh, yield farming on different DeFi protocols uh, that are out there. So while well, time is actually running out on us, but let me just ask one last question to each and every one of you. So what is the most interesting sector uh, in DeFi space uh, for you personally at this juncture? Anyone? So, yeah, so I, I, I'm usually well prepared to answer this. So one of the things that I've been uh, researching while observing the, the KYC AML compliant regulatory landscape that, that is coming sometime in the next, you know, however long it takes the governments to get their acts together is, you know, when, when that's all, when it's a 100% kosher for anyone, any financial institution anywhere in the world to, to start doing stuff on DeFi, what kind of stuff are they likely to want to do, right? And I, this, I think I brought this up earlier in the conversation because I, I, I'm not convinced that they're going to want to lend ETH on Aave. I'm not convinced that they're going to want to trade wrap Bitcoin for Chainlink. Uh, I think that it, it is going to be these, these huge, um, you know, capital machines, things like alternative risk transfer vehicles and um, the ILS and specifically things like, um, you know, what, what pension funds are doing, things like, you know, um, international overnight bank lending. I think that these are all the sorts of things that DeFi should be paying more attention to. And it is worlds away from anything that anyone's talking about right now. Everything that we're doing right now is to cater for the, the retail users that we've found. And of course, that, that makes sense. Um, but when we start talking about institutional money, I just think that there's going to be this kind of culture shock when they finally get here and, and say, you know, how do I, how do I ensure you know, California against earthquakes. Can you guys do that for me? You know, or yeah, I, these are the things that I think DeFi should really start waking up to right now, because by the time the institutions get here, it's already too late, right? We need to have these products ready to go. And it's, um, it, it's going to take a, a, a huge amount of work. Um, these are the kinds of things that you actually require government assistance for, right? We, we're going to need protocols that are partially subsidized by, by governments. Um, in order to offer these kinds of um, risk transfers. And so, yeah, in, in this sense, I actually think that a huge portion of TVL in the future will come from government treasuries um, in order to, in, you know, in, insure themselves against um, you know, certain risks. I also think it could be used for things like, you know, international remittance or, um, you know, um, automatic, you know, payroll, things like that, um, especially for extremely large corporations like a defense force. You know, I, I have a feeling that th these are the sorts of things that DeFi really ought to be paying more attention to. And right now we're kind of got this, you know, total tunnel vision, right? Where we're, we're still focused on optimizing the, the products that we came out of the gates with in, in 2017. And I still think that that's the right thing to be doing right now. But I think as, a, as an industry, um, we need to start talking to each other more, um, start, you know, relaxing maybe some of this um, competitive advantage paranoia. Um, and start working on how, you know, uh, how we can start building out the infrastructure that, that banks, governments, you know, pension funds and insurance companies are expecting to be ready when they, when they finally arrive. I, I, um, I, I agree. I agree with you. I just, I think that a lot of that's going to take longer than we, we think. I, I, I like a hundred percent. That's where the, where the long-term value is. I, I, I have this model internally that I call the, uh, the, 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 the financial layer cake. And it's just like each level builds on the next and each level has another layer of complexity. So the first layer of the financial layer cake were the intrinsic assets, things that you could just create that didn't have any reference to an external source. So like Ethereum, Bitcoin, uh, and then like this explosion we had in 2017 of lots of ERC 20s. Some of those stayed around. Those are also intrinsic. They have like they're mostly intrinsic to the system. So those are things that we've built financial products around, like Aave and Sushi Swap and all that kind of stuff. And then the next level up, we have like this. We we have representations of money, and there are lots of experiments going on with that. Some of those are stable coins, USDC, USDT, and others are things like algorithmic stuff, like what uh, or partially algorithmic, um, like what Terra and Luna's doing. 
and other and other people in the space now well, the reason that we need those is because we need settlements if you want to build a financial product you have to be able to settle it and a lot of the time settlement you don't want to have in something that is volatile because you don't want to take two bets you just want the bet on the thing that you actually want to do the next layer up as far as i'm concerned and I, it's really interesting debate if, if people think these are other ways but um is is things like options and derivatives because an option and derivative if you have a settlement instrument and you have a data feed, you don't need anything else. You can just program the rest of that logic in. So I think that like perpetuals, synthetics, um, swaps are like, and swaps I think are coming quite quite soon actually, because uh, Aave, and, uh, Aave and, and Compound are gonna want to do more around fixed interest rate, but need some kind of secondary market around the synthetics to be able to do that. So I think that that's the big next step is like, Swaps and perpetuals and synthetics are, are, are where we're going to next because we've now got enough good representations of money to start to do more complex financial stuff. And then the next layer up, you, you, you want settlement of real world assets, um, but you need to have representations of that. Now, we started with things like, OK, we've got an institution that can have money in a bank. And so we, we, we certify to that. But if we widen that to, for example, an exchange for coffee that is certifying the existence of coffee and allowing the trade and the settlement and then you so like commodities and stuff like that will that will probably be the first thing that we start to do real settlement of. Uh, and then it's just sort of going to go up the value chain uh, towards more and more complexity. And right at the top is, is things like stocks and shares. And the reason that's right at the top is because they're really, really complicated instruments. They have like so many rules that go with them. And we keep trying to jump to them as an industry. We keep going, oh, we're going to do stocks and shares. And it's like, no, they, they, these are the hardest things to do because of shareholder rights and drag and tag alongs and like dividending and like seniority and all of this really complicated stuff. So I'm really excited about everything that Mark said, um, but I think that the next like the next three years is probably going to be still more in the synthetic phase before we start doing real, real um, banking uh, and, and, and real world products. Yeah, and I, I would say, you know, I guess it, we're all of us are probably biased, but everything that Piers and Mark have said, I'm super excited about. Um, I think the other thing that I think about a lot is just the integration of DeFi into traditional finance, like we alluded to earlier, and some of that is being led by neobanks and fintech companies, right? So to the extent that we have um, new kind of fintech or neobank startups that integrate anchor savings or other DeFi um, savings primitives into their offering to users um, and provide a solution that is you know, competitive to inflation, if not much better than that, um, I think that's a, a kind of leeway into getting the larger institutions onboarded onto DeFi. So hopefully that powers the next millions of users. Um, and then with this grassroots movement happening, um, that brings on more institutions as well. Yeah, I didn't want it to sound like, you know, my uh, my head is completely in, in the clouds oh, no. thinking about what oh, this stuff is happening. I, it's, <laughs> I know it sounds pretty blue sky. I just think that this is, um, you know, totally. it, it, one of the things that DeFi is unusually well suited to, to solving. Um, but yeah, I, I think of the things that I appreciate the most, not just the things I'm interested in, I still think, you know, empowering the individual and um, giving them a, a safe, simple, and, um, you know, an even fun way to, to, um, to, to use their capital to, um, you know, to achieve a, a financial goal is still the thing that, that uh, makes me get up every morning and, and continuing to do what I do. Yeah. Okay. What about Amanda? Any thoughts on this before we wrap up the discussion? Yes, yeah, so I think like uh, definitely March 2021 was the big boom of the JPEG. And I'm just excited for like to see how NFTs and DeFi marry uh, with our new upcoming platform show you. And I'm really excited to see, as I mentioned before, like the emergence of social tokens and just see more like clever use cases of nfts and then you know uh, social tokens really bouncing off those uh, clever use cases and then seeing how DeFi can really expand you know the, the average person's business um, and expand something like even a fan base and incentivize that fan base through the DeFi tools that we have and i think we're going to actually expose like such a wider and very, very novel group of people to this world uh, through social tokens, through like the influencer community. 
And I think that it's just a match made in heaven and I can't wait to get started. I can't wait to see how DeFi and NFTs collide and all these tools will try to make it as, as easy as possible for them to understand. But yeah, it's going to be like a huge, a huge year this year and next for, for that. All right. Thanks, Amanda. So, and um, we have come to an end um, uh, of the panel discussion and thank you uh, to all of you for taking time out uh, for this panel discussion, which I thought provided really excellent insights, you know, onto the questions that were asked. And um, um, any closing remarks before we, we, we you know, like um, close the panel discussion? Anyone? It was, it was such a such a pleasure to speak <laughs> with, with all of you. I, I really enjoyed, uh, you know, bouncing ideas off of everyone. I, uh, I thought, I, I hope that you guys found this, you know, not, um, not, not just interesting to participate in, but as actively, but also passively as I did. I really enjoyed listening to all of you and I'm actually going, I can't wait for this uh, podcast to be released because I'm going to rewatch it and um, pay more attention to, to what everyone was saying rather than just trying to think about what I wanted to contribute. I thank you so much everyone for all of your input. I really enjoyed it. Definitely, same here. I just like, yeah, thanks to Good Five for inviting me and like being such a great partner to Sushi and all these like, uh, you know, phenomenal protocols that we are you know in partnership with and you know definitely big thanks also to pierce i think i'm really not trying to be funny but pierce i think you can single-handedly get the 100 billion users because you're very the, your cadence is just fantastic I think, <laughs> so yeah i think we're going to be successful on this uh this cause but thanks so much guys thank you thank all you right guys. okay thank you everyone and again thanks tamara and rio from good five for organizing this Bye. See ya. See ya. In this video, we're focusing on single-sided liquidity pools and their role in DeFi. Liquidity pools were first introduced by Bancor, but were made popular by Uniswap and other automated market makers. A liquidity pool can be thought of like a bucket of tokens. How full the bucket is, is how much value is contained in the bucket. The bucket itself is a smart contract that controls what can go in and taken out of the bucket. These smart contracts are referred to in this video as platforms. There is no one owner of the contents of the bucket. Instead, anyone can put some tokens into the bucket, and then they own a percentage of the bucket equal to the number of tokens they put in. So if I put 10 tokens into a bucket that already has 90 tokens, that bucket will now have 100 tokens and I will own 10% of the bucket. There are several types of buckets, or liquidity pools as they are more commonly called in DeFi. Single asset, two-sided and multi-asset pools. We will only be covering single pools in this video. Single asset pools are used by platforms like Aave, Bancor, or Compound, and they only contain one type of token, such as ETH or USDC or DAI tokens. Users who add tokens to these pools are called liquidity providers, or LPs for short. Liquidity provision is at the core of decentralized finance and a great starting point for anyone looking to get into DeFi. These platforms then allow the pool tokens to be used by the market. In exchange for being able to use the liquidity being provided by these tokens, market participants will pay interests or fees for their use of this liquidity. The amount of interest or fees that are earned by liquidity providers really depends on the market demand for liquidity in that token. Some days, the market really needs USDC. Other days, it really needs something else. This means that interest and fees can fluctuate day to day, and so you will often see a different rate being offered by a particular platform on a daily or sometimes hourly basis. But that is nothing to worry about, and it all averages out over time. Generally speaking, it is best to start picking your favorite asset and your favorite platform and starting simple. Trying to chase the hottest or highest return pool is often a game that can drive you a little crazy, and moving assets around can get expensive. Picking your starter asset and platform 
and then being patient is always a great way of starting. Your pool might not be the hottest now, but it might be next week, so don't worry too much. As you can see, liquidity provision is a fantastic way of participating in the DeFi market without having to be too active. To provide liquidity, you simply have to send tokens you own into a pool and leave them there for as long or as short as you like. All the time it sits there, it's earning interest for you. It might seem complex at first, but once you understand it, they are a great opportunity to put assets you already have to work, and you will be helping decentralized finance grow. We've included links for more information on each of the platforms we've covered in this video below.